following program on Ada Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Good evening, this is a special presentation on Other Than Under 24. As you know, this time slot is scheduled for Get Real, but unfortunately, due to the fact that Mahesh Johnny is under the weather, we will not be able to have that program. But still, we want you to hear from the guest that Mahesh originally wanted to speak to, Professor Gigi Foster, who is joining me now via Zoom from Sydney in Australia. As we had mentioned here, Professor Gigi Foster is a professor at the School of Economics in the University of New South Wales. Uh, she's an author and she has supported us in a, a variety of ways in being a resource provider during tensious and very critical times within uh, the, the pandemic period actually. And uh, today she's joining us to talk about the post-pandemic discussion, post-COVID, how the economics have really translated in the real world. Uh, professor, thank you so much for joining us once again uh, on this program and really uh, giving us uh, authentic take, uh, something that a lot of economists wouldn't have been giving uh, during the past few years. Uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us. It's my, my great pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, all right, Professor, let's uh, get into the discussion directly. My first question is, in terms of the post-pandemic economic discussion, as in there were multiple, the, the way it impacted countries was very different. And now it has really created new, new order in the world about how the countries are going about their uh, daily activities. We see countries like ours having to look at alternative pathways like the IMF. And it seems like we are going to join in this sort of whirlwind in this uh, never ending loop of us not going towards development, but rather something else. Uh, in, in that context, Professor, how do you exactly identify the post pandemic economic discussion going forward? What should we be mindful of? Well, that's a big question, and I think it does differ depending on what country you're in. Certainly in the West, we've seen cracks emerging in the mainstream narrative about what the COVID policies were all about and what they were intended to achieve, basically because it has been found that they haven't achieved uh, in any measure what they had initially been um, promoted to do. So we don't have lower deaths from COVID. We don't have lower deaths overall. In fact, we're seeing excess deaths across the West. And people are kind of shrugging their shoulders and almost in disbelief in some circles and in other circles, just trying to memory hold the whole thing, just forget about what, what happened. And in, in some circles that are now awakening to the, the abuse and the betrayal that has been visited upon populations in the developed world, um, there's increasing rising anger and a sense of, uh, of a need basically to call out the elites for having made the disastrous policy calls that they did during this period. We see not only the excess deaths, but also uh, skyrocketing inflation in many cases, kind of a doldrums in the economic realm uh, of the labor market and, and productivity measures not really recovering much. We have had here in Australia a bumper harvest and some rollout of communications, telecommunications equipment. So that has helped in productivity terms. but. Labor productivity itself doesn't look like really going anywhere. So the general tenor in the West, I think, is that the game is up, but many people don't want to see it because they are psychologically tethered or financially tethered to the story that was told, it was spun during the COVID era. And uh, yet we have to deal with the real consequences. And so we're having huge rate rises by central banks. We're having real belt tightening by a lot of middle income and lower income Australians. Uh, we have a huge number of people in Australia who own houses and, and owe a lot of money in mortgage debt to banks. And those mortgage repayments are going up because they're generally on variable rate terms, at least after the first few years. And so that has yet really to fully flow through to many of our households. So we basically are entering a, an economic, well, not entering, we've been in it for a while, but it's continuing this economic uncertainty and general recessionary sort of feel, even though it may not necessarily qualify formally as a recession. Now in the developing world, like Sri Lanka, 
uh, things are arguably even worse. Uh, you have obviously uh, much more close to the bone um, families, households that are really just trying to make ends meet. And they're being now told that they have to pay more taxes and give more of their own uh, dwindling resources to the government in order to qualify for loans from this on high uh, organization, the IMF. And there hasn't really been investment in the kinds of initiatives that, for example, a country like India used back in the 80s to drag itself out of poverty, the, the, the trade, the international trade, the foreign trade that really helped India a lot. There was competition amongst different areas in India for business that was being offered by um, overseas companies. And, and really, the Sri Lankan leadership hasn't focused on that. It hasn't focused on what it is that Sri Lanka can offer the world and investing in those kinds of activities. Instead, we've seen a huge amount of bloating in the civil service. We now have something like 1.5, I think, million people in, in the public service. There's a huge yeah. number, huge amount of waste there. And, uh, you know, that's not what's being targeted. What's being targeted to raise money is, um, you know, the everyday Sri Lankan, um, the health workers, the education workers, and no wonder they're striking. So I feel it's a time of great tumult and and, and you feel it there on the streets in Sri Lanka. It has been partially the fault of Western governments that this has happened to you <laughs> because we're the ones who made the decisions about COVID policy that essentially stopped the tourism trade, which was something on which Sri Lanka was relying a lot and has created this disruption around the world and ports and the supply chains, which we're still working out, has created inflationary conditions. And so it's, it's not looking like a pleasant time for Sri Lanka. And I, I'm not sure that the current economic leadership is aware of how how dire the situation is and the kinds of actions that could be taken to really um, improve the lot of Sri Lanka going forward. Uh, Professor, I want to unpack certain things that you were mentioning in that I think a lot of important elements there. Uh, one thing that you were talking about is the economic model that India undertook. And I think this was under Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's uh, government where they tried to you know, sort of like open their country up. What we at this particular juncture are not looking at industrialization. Now you reference the tourism industry. We see that we were so so much based on the services sector within our country that we couldn't really make ends meet once there was a complete shutdown. Now as you have been one of the I guess the most vocal voice in this in this regards and we'll talk about the Twitter aspect of this in a while. But when when this entire conversation was coming out, how can Sri Lanka really cushion itself moving forward? Because regardless of the economic model that the country is following, we see that the economic thinking hasn't really like changed much at all. We see that that same sort of liberal uh, ideology is still being infiltrated into our policymaking system. So there are two aspects to this, the ground reality and the theoretical aspect that we are looking at, neither of which are being cushioned by the current government, by the current policies. What should we really do there? Huh. Yeah, look, that, that's an interesting way to sum it up. And the distance between theory and reality is something that has increased during the COVID period. And it's hugely present in my discipline of economics. Plenty of academic economists fiddle around with various esoteric models, but those models don't actually reflect reality and they're not actually helpful to people on the ground trying to make resource allocation decisions to help people, right? And, and so that's a major problem. And we've discovered that if we hadn't already known it during the COVID time when so few uh, professionals who, who actually could do so spoke out against the disastrous policymaking. What does Sri Lanka do? Look, I'm not one of these people who bangs on about only manufacturing. I, I think that whatever advantage you have in terms of comparative advantage, you know, in the traditional sense of, of what will help Sri Lanka to fill a niche that, that hasn't been as well filled by other countries, you should exploit, you should invest in. So from my perspective, I mean, I visited Sri Lanka back in the 80s, it was a while ago, but I do remember that the natural beauty and tourism is a natural thing to invest in, but there's plenty of other stuff as well. I mean, India does a huge textile um, uh, industry. Uh, textiles are an obvious thing, but so are, for example, call centers where you speak English. Speaking English is huge. Right? There aren't that many yeah. uh, countries that really have that advantage. So figuring out ways to make that work for you, uh, and it might be services or it might be you know subsidiary industries, uh, industries that are making things for overseas, um, uh, you know, putting together of, of final goods. I'm not sure, but I do think you should be looking at all avenues, including, for example, China. Right? Don't just look at the West. Um, there is this developing divide, as we spoke about the last time I was on, between the Western bloc. Exactly and kind of everybody else. And the everybody else uh, is actually, I mean, as much as they may be 
more violent in some ways, and, and it may look as though they're not as uh, promoting of, of democratic ideals. The reality is in the West, we have these elites who are trying to basically usurp freedoms and, and tell people what to do and, and make their societies much more totalitarian and really um, hamper their development and their growth going forward. So I don't think it would be a bad thing at all to look at what China is offering. And, uh, you know, maybe having that kind of trade link with China might be a better option than telling the IMF yes, please give us more money. And in return, we'll beat our poor citizens over the head with higher taxes. And where where are the countries in the West getting the higher taxes from? Well, it, sometimes they try from their citizens, but the real place where the tax revenue exists that's not being collected is in multinational companies, actually. And so to the extent that the tax base is being eroded uh, you know, in the West, it's, it's really that the companies are able to hide wealth overseas. And that's been a major problem here for for years and years and and that's where most of the wealth is and again I, I think in the case of Sri Lanka there's an awful lot that could be cut from the civil service and you could not just monetarily penalize the civil service workers but you could actually ask them here's a novel idea to commit some of their time to actually solving problems on the ground so maybe you know if you have a top layer job somewhere in the civil service make it a requirement that one day per month you have to be out and about in a constituency somewhere picking up trash or feeding the homeless or uh, helping children, the tutoring or something. Give back with your time to your country. I mean, this is a time to be to be having everybody contribute in the ways they can. And frankly, if you have a secure job in the civil service, I reckon that the the expectation there should be higher, that you truly give back in some way that that is a real sacrifice from the, you know, the cushy job that you have. Professor, uh Again, I think that's the, the mindset aspect that you are referring to, which is very important. I'm, I'm very glad that you mentioned that. One thing I want to pick up on what you were mentioning is, Professor, the austerity aspect. We, I want to like, give some time to, like, to really look at this. Now, there's a classic case of austerity happening in Sri Lanka, just uh, as we look at it. We also see this in the United Kingdom, and there is a huge conversation happening there. I want to sort of like understand the lessons that we can learn from the West in terms of how austerity is being established, austerity being the high taxes that you were talking about. What exactly is the objective there? And you referenced that the multinationals are really hiding their wealth and that is where this entire mismatch between the austerity measure, the, the taxation isn't really happening. What are the lessons that we can learn from that, Professor? Because now we as a country are also looking at like a textbook version of applying austerity, a textbook version of really hiking taxes. What can we learn about how this can actually be at least more productive than what it is right now? Well, uh, it's, it's a difficult question. And one of the big problems is the people who are in power in any society, whether it's Sri Lanka or, or someplace you know, in Australia or the other developed world, um, they generally don't have an incentive to increase taxes on their friends. <laughs> and so it's very difficult to get taxes raised on the people who actually have a lot of money. So, um, you know, the people who are richer uh, and the companies, that, that's just a very difficult thing to get past politically. And it's also very difficult to pass often the most efficient taxes. So, you know, I could, I could spend a whole program talking with you about efficient taxation, the different types of tax that one could potentially implement. But I'll give one example, which is something that basically all economists in the world pretty much agree is a very efficient tax uh, system, which is to tax unimproved land. Here in Australia, if we had unimproved land taxes, it would be much more efficient than our existing system of taxing, you know, sort of various ways, the exchange of land. Um, you know, we have stamp duty is what it's called and, and other kinds of taxes, which, which push people's behavior away from what would otherwise be their behavior. And that's distortionary tax, which we don't like in economics because it wastes uh, welfare, wastes surplus. So from, from that perspective, a more efficient tax is just to say, look, whatever land you own is just taxed on the basis of the value that it is assessed to have. And that means that if you happen to be the beneficiary of uh, a windfall gain, because let's say a shopping center opens next door and the house you bought suddenly jerks up in price, well, that means that you have to pay tax on that land, right? And and that means that you, you're able to capture as a society some of that windfall gain instead of just having it be schlepped away to the pocket of that person who happened to get lucky by owning the land. So there are taxes that are more efficient than others, but oftentimes those are exactly the ones that the people in power, the elites, don't like to pass because they affect primarily the people who are 
landed, who owned the land, right? And that means the richer portion of the population. So we have a real political problem there in, in terms of figuring out how to get past the kinds of changes to, to, to taxation that would actually improve the efficiency of the taxation system and have a chance of collecting more tax. Now, of course, the imperative to tax is different in Sri Lanka versus in the West right now. So in the West, we have this problem of a, of a ballooning uh, amount of debt that we've accumulated during the COVID period because we you know, created money in order to pump money into the economy. In the case of Australia, we called these programs JobKeeper and, and other kinds of fiscal stimulus programs that were intended to staunch the wounds of lockdowns. Right. We, we pushed pause on our economies. And so then we had to do something to keep people from running out of money. And so we just pumped money in. But the economy was at the same time basically stalled. And so in that situation, it becomes very inflationary. And we had to take out, you know, we had to basically create money. And we are now in debt for those kinds of expenditures. So there's an imperative to pay back that debt to get the books back in balance. And so that's where the the, the desire to increase more money, come, increase, increase tax take comes from. In Sri Lanka, of course, it's an IMF imperative more than anything, right? And so the deal is you get this loan from the IMF if somehow you can prove that as a government that you'll be able to raise that money um yeah. you know why not consider some slashes to again public service right why are we punishing the health and education workers who are keeping the country running and trying to invest in its future true uh professor a lot of things that i want to pick up on on what you just mentioned as well we take a very short break we are in conversation with professor gg foster you're watching a special presentation here on update 24 stay with us Welcome back. This is a special presentation on Other Than Internet 24. We are in conversation with Professor Gigi Foster, Professor at the School of Economics in the University of New South Wales. Uh, professor, within this segment, I want to start by what areas that Sri Lanka can work on right now, because now an industrialized base, as in we were just talking about it before, and what you mentioned was you don't want to really be like to have a blanket, we need to have a manufacturing policy per se, but really work on our strengths. But we see that an industrialized industrialized base sort of like where there is uh, even the primary industries that are growing very well in a country would really let you fall back onto them when an issue like this comes up. What exactly do you suggest are things that Sri Lanka needs to focus on right now, given that uh, within wh whatever happened, we have now really like gone into these uh, COVID policies in, in the past few, few years. We went into these policies without really looking at the future. And then it was either you and like a few others who really looked at it in a holistic manner and tried to mention something different. And there was a huge backlash. I think the conversation was where you were you identified as a fringe economist at one point. I think with that sort of with that sort of mindset that existed in the past, Professor, what exactly can we, as Sri Lankans, can we focus on today? Because we have to understand that this might again happen, that the backlash towards people like you might come out again, because the ideological sort of renaissance hasn't really occurred in the West in terms of how economics really works on a practical level. What would you suggest that Sri Lanka should focus on right now? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, I want to just before I answer that question, just pick up on what you say, the ideological, uh, you know, advancement or, or revolution or sort of the understanding that what economics should be about is developing policy that's good for people. And that requires a big picture perspective. That's something we're missing right now. Many, many economists are, are very hyper specialized right now and and that's the result of years and years of uh of, of morphing the discipline into one that rewards significant specialization two generations ago that was not the case my thesis advisor's thesis advisor used to flit in and out between academia and policy land where he would give actual advice to people making resource allocation decisions that's much less common today and the reason is because most people in, in, in the ivory tower who are economists have specialized so, so heavily in one particular narrow area that they're basically not able to see the whole picture and to give good advice. And it's not even seen as valuable in the academy to, to consider what's going on in your country, to, to think that the problems of your economy are important. <laughs> right, that's actually kind of unfashionable. So that's one of the big problems we have. Right now. And not only in academia, but in the economy as a whole, it's rare to find 
people who are true generalists, who really understand the, the, how the whole system works and ha- who can give advice on exactly the kind of question you just asked me. So again, going back to first principles, what you look for is what are your comparative advantages and where are your underutilized resources? So one of the classic um, pieces of advice that you get from you know studying economic development through history is you want to educate the women and you want to make sure that people have baseline health care. Education and health are just basic. That's why I say when you're when you're trying to raise money, don't try to don't penalize the the health workers and the educational workers. That's what keeps your economy going, and that's where your your future, you know, really rests. If you don't have a healthy and reasonably educated workforce, you are going to be condemned to continuing a, a low productivity, low skilled sort of economy where you're just not going to develop. All right. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and the same thing can be true in Africa as well and uh, pretty much any place where you want to develop. So whether that's manufacturing, and I'm, I agree with you, manufacturing is has an appeal to it, or whether it's high level services, um, I, I think you can have a combination of those things. And again, it's more about being practical in a particular circumstance. Where is your labor? Where are the skills? And can you invest in more skills and upskill people towards a particular kind of industrial strategy? using government subsidies if you need to, but then get people on the ground at their community level uh, incentivized to keep working and, and build businesses and have the government get out of the way of, of business building. So that's one thing that's really a problem during the COVID era is that government inserted itself into economies to stop business, to, to halt and hamper businesses all over the world. And we got a lot of pressure on small and medium enter- enterprises particularly who just couldn't afford the kinds of adjustments that were being asked of them by their governments. And and those are the engines of, of many economies, right? And so you don't want to do that. You want the government to be in service to the economy, in service to the people who elect it. And to help with that, you want to try to reduce red tape, reduce the amount of public service bureaucracy you've got flying around and help people to invest in skills where you think they probably have a comparative advantage. And again, looking at Sri Lanka, English language skill is a huge one. Train people in that because even if they leave, right, even if some of your young people leave, they will send remittances home. And remittance income is huge, as you know, for many developing countries. It's one of the main sources of income in many developing countries. So it isn't like you lose the game if you educate your young people and they go overseas and get a good job. That's actually success. Uh, Professor, in in terms of the education aspect, I think you are really touching the grassroots level of what we should be doing. if I, if I suggest this sort of thought process to you, wouldn't that be sort of like a long term measure that you're suggesting? What do you think we can do maybe even in the short term to look into this? Or is it that Sri Lanka shouldn't be looking at short term, you know, patch fixes, but rather a more long term sort of economic narrative? Look, I mean, you have to be looking at, at short term and long term together, I think. Uh, but I do also think that a, a lot of what the government is focused on is really in service to this more global narrative rather than in service to the country and, and what is good for it right now and, and going forward. Again, look at the I mean, I, I you know, I haven't looked in detail at your you know government's balance sheet and the, and the country's balance sheet in, in particular areas, particular regions. But you know, get an independent uh, economist uh, group to come on and and do an analysis of what's going on in your country and where the potential hidden capacity is and and figure out how to invest in those capacities rather than listening to somebody else's narrative that tells you you must do X in order to get our prize. You know, that that's that's unhelpful for an independent country that, that really needs to look after itself in the long run or you're always going to be a slave to these uh, narratives that come down from above. And again, I would mention the public service. If the public service is supposed to be looking after the people, well, it can take a pay cut itself. It can uh, do some actual service, you know, some public service, direct public service, not just sitting behind a desk in a in a cushy job and and you know filing paperwork and feeling good about itself. That's that's not actually helpful. And the pendulum has swung too far in that direction. We have these massive bloated bureaucracies, not just in Sri Lanka, in the West as well, which are no longer really helping our societies and our populations. So I would say the population can demand that, can demand public service reform that there be KPIs associated with being in the public service that have to do with direct help towards uh, individual communities. And the communities themselves need to stop looking above or you know, to, to, the, to the government to try to support them and, and 
help them, but rather look to each other and and reject the divisive narratives that are being promoted by both the global and the and the national leadership sometimes that says, for example, you are nothing but a viral vector and you're a threat to you know your neighbor. That's not helpful. It's not going to get you to a, a mental framework where you're cooperating with that neighbor and figuring out ways you can help each other. But that's what you need to be doing as Sri Lankans. You need to be looking towards your communities and, and the, the strength of community that's been lost a bit during this period of, um, you know, overreach of governments and, and a, a, an increasing mindset that somehow it's the government that has to save us. Well, no, the government has abused you during this period. So you need to get over that and uh, ideally, of course, have an acknowledgement of what's happened and, uh, and a reckoning. But whether that happens or not, it's still on the shoulders of every Sri Lankan to work out, OK, what can I do to help my my family, my community and and to pressure the government as I can, where I can with my vote uh, to, to deliver more to our communities directly rather than just protecting the people who are uh, in the elite and their friends. Uh, Professor, uh, something I want to really touch on there is you mentioned key performance indicators that was particularly in reference to uh, these institutions as in the, the public service sector and everything. Uh, I want to ask you maybe a little bit of a different question there. What are the indicators that we need to be looking at right now? Because are we to generally just look at okay, inflation, we are looking at unemployment, we look at the general things that in terms of where our country is heading. Why, the reason why I'm capitalizing on this is, Professor, you, I think, I, I only heard it from you, you were talking about those, the, the good, as in the, the productive years that an individual could live in, live during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you, you, you were mentioning that that was a calculation that we need to account for when doing these lockdowns and closures and whatnot. So a very nuanced take of how we need to look at indicators. Is there something of that sort that we as a country need to be looking at right now in Sri Lanka? Or should we just rely on the basic indicators that have been given to us? Yeah, so, I mean, again, we could have a whole show on this, but um, essentially economists often target GDP per capita uh, and other yeah, kind exactly. of related measures because, because that correlates reasonably well with what we generally care about, which is human thriving. But there is a new currency that I use actually in one of my books that you'll see behind me. Uh, in, in fact, both of those books, I, I, I use it a bit. It's called The Wellbe, The Wellbeing Year, and it's built from a self-evaluation of life satisfaction. So there are questions in social surveys worldwide, including I'm sure Sri Lanka, that ask people, oh, Overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? People answer that question on a zero to 10 scale, where zero is not satisfied at all, and 10 is very satisfied. And on average in Australia, a healthy person would answer about an eight. Um, somebody indifferent between living and dying would answer about a two. And so you get from that that roughly six increments on that scale is kind of equal to one um, healthy life. And if, if somebody enjoys those six increments for one year, that's basically what we would call then six wellbies. So each wellbie is one increment on that scale, that answer scale, enjoyed for one person for one year. This measure arguably captures what we actually directly care about as humans, which is whether or not you are happy in your life. Yeah? And this is going to capture everything from how warm are your relationships to how healthy do you feel to how secure is your family's finance, uh, how, how happy are your children? many things that, that go into forming a good life, essentially. And I think you could look at this for different groups in society to work out where are the real points of pain in the society um, and, and where can you then invest also as a government to assist with this. If you really do want to direct government money towards helping people, um, there's a huge amount of prior literature to work out exactly what kinds of government expenditure deliver highest quantities of well-bees. So refer to that literature um, and you can look for, there's a reference I can give you, uh, a happy choice, well-being as a goal for government. That's uh, a, a book chapter that was put out by actually my co-author on the Great COVID Panic, along with his team at the London School of Economics a few years ago, which documents this new uh, measure, this new currency, and, and gives references to uh, this huge cottage industry of um, social science research on how exactly we generate human well-being using government expenditure. And so that would be one place to start, where you could have a look at what a, a Sri Lanka is doing right now and what it might be able to do with the limited funds that it has in order to, uh, in the short run at least, increase people's quality of life. Uh, Professor, on that note, if, if we can just uh, develop on that, I think this will be more of a personal question from you. Have you seen the reception that you, you got back in the day and the reception that you'll be getting right now?
and this comes in a context of there being active censoring of your ideology, even Dr. J. Bhattacharya's ideology on Twitter, like the mainstream media channels, so mainstream social media rather. Do you see the reception from the economic community or the academic community has changed over time to what, what it is, what, to what it was back in about two or three years ago? Um, yes, there definitely is less hate mail coming into my inbox every day now. Right. And there's a, a gradual dawning of the realization that maybe I actually had a point and, and other people who were speaking out against the COVID measures actually had a point. But we certainly aren't getting any, you know, orders of Australia and knighthoods for it because uh, there are huge amounts of money and power and state is still wrapped up in the narrative that you know we we did the right thing or at the very least we couldn't have known and so everything that we are now talking about on this program and you know elsewhere in relation to COVID policy uh, is something that only could be possibly known in hindsight right and so there's no blame to be uh to be accepted by the people who are in power now note there have been a lot of departures uh, by people who were in power during the COVID era over the past year or two, right? So Fauci has stepped down. We've had a lot of departures in politics uh, across the West, and uh, you guys have even had a change of leadership. And so, you know, th that is an indicator that there's a bit of reading of the writing on the wall, shall we say, by some of the people who are in power. Uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand is another big name example that's very close to my home, uh, who, you know, basically said, look, it's too difficult for my health. I can't continue. And she's, what, mid-40s? You know, she's, she really should only be getting started in her political career. Why has it been difficult for her health? Well, because it was actually destructive. All of her policies were destructive of New Zealand's well-being and future economic prosperity. And so at some level, she knows that now. And I think that is part of what's causing her such pain and causing her to be exhausted. And the same can be true of many people around the world who are involved in COVID policy setting. But one of the big problems we have is not just that a lot of money and power and guns are on the side of the COVID narrative, but also that even the person on the street often during the COVID period did some things that indicated to him and to others that he was going along with the policies. So for him to now confront the reality that those policies on net destroyed human welfare and, and brought economic development back by 10 years anyway, um, that's a real psychological shock. So that is a big problem because it means that there's not much willingness to actually reckon with the truth, realize what happened and move forward in a productive way where we no longer are accepting these sorts of divisive and authoritarian policies from our leadership and actually insist on policies that are healthy and pro-human and are encouraging us to work together and be confident and celebrate diversity instead of punishing diversity of opinion and thereby um, essentially punishing anybody who wants to come up with a new way of doing things because by the way that is how growth happens innovation comes from new ideas so if you crush dissent you're crushing innovation you're crushing your future growth potential and i think that 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 is a reality to which more and more people are waking up at some level but for the reasons i've explained it's not an easy thing to admit and so it's a very very slow process frustratingly slow you know painfully slow for those of us who have been saying the same things for three years um but i think that what we should be doing in the resistance uh, worldwide is thinking about new models, reform agendas that we can put on the table when the moment is right, when our societies actually are finally ready to reckon with the dis disastrous mistakes that were made during this era and to try to set up some institutional uh, pushbacks against the possibility that this kind of disaster will ever befall us again. Right. Uh, Professor, a few more things that I want to discuss with you. We'll take a very short break. We're in conversation with Professor Gigi Foster and you are joining us on a special presentation on Alzheimer 24. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is a special presentation on Other Than 24. We are in discussion with Professor Gigi Foster, Professor of the School of Economics in the University of New South Wales. Uh, Professor, two very important segments that we just passed. And within this uh, segment, I want to again zoom out a bit more from our country and to look at the global uh, sort of incidences that are happening, the events that are occurring that are really impacting our country in a, in a large way. And one of them which we cannot ignore is the situation in Ukraine. Now. Uh, one particular aspect that I'd like to ask you, Professor, is that we see 
in certain scenarios, there is a similar approach that we took during the pandemic, a more uninformed, uh, rather misinformed uh, way of approaching these uh, special events, Spe specifically when there has been an uh, established way of how we could react to them, just like putting it out of the window and then reacting in an ad hoc manner. What are your sentiments pertaining to how the world and how a country like Sri Lanka should be reacting to situations like that, particularly with regards to uh, s events that are impacting the whole world, uh, particularly localized in like a certain area? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think the Ukraine um, crisis is one that could have been resolved much, much earlier. Um, and that really what's happened here is Ukraine has been a pawn of the West and uh, attempts to negotiate for peace were stymied by the Western powers multiple times. And um, I don't think it was right of, of Russia to invade, but at the same time, there's obvious geopolitical reasons why Putin did. <laughs> and to ignore those reasons and to somehow pretend as though everything is black and white and there's a clear, you know, good side and a clear evil side and, uh, and that, you know, every person in Ukraine is a hero and every person in Russia is, a, is, a, is an evil demon is just puerile. I mean, that's kindergarten stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it's exactly. as if all of the adults are, have gone from the room I know I mean, there's 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 really been just a catastrophic failure of leadership there to to actually promote what is good for the world not just the those countries but the, the world as a whole because as you know it's caused a huge amount of disruption um, not as much as the covid policies did to be a frank but still a huge amount of disruption and we are now seeing all manner of, of ridiculous policies particularly in relation to energy uh, in Europe and and this kind of uh, shooting oneself in the foot sort of policy, you know, like, oh, well, we must now penalize all of the coal fired generating plants and anybody who uses uh, standard fossil fuel energy because that's the right thing to do when Europe is already facing uh, all sorts of economic difficulty. Why do you punish people then? I mean, that's just it's just mindless ideological posturing for for really no concrete benefit. So there's just a lot of, again, just silly stuff happening, frankly. And again, this is a problem of not having enough generalists who are advising on policy settings. You know, it, it's not the case that there's that there's no value in, in renewable energy investments. Of course there is. But you need to balance that with the actual needs of people on the ground, real, real needs, you know, and you're going to be talking about killing people or, or significantly uh, reducing their quality of life uh, in the short run, in the pursuit of some long run end, which is not really fully articulated. If, if you, you know, look at a lot of the climate change sort of uh, narratives that go along. And that's very similar, by the way, to the COVID policies, same pattern. You had a narrative where current pain, current sacrifice is somehow being justified on the basis Basis that we're going to get a future benefit. Well, in the case of COVID, that future benefit didn't materialize. All we found ourselves with are, is basically countries that are weaker, unhealthier, poorer, and in more stress than they were before COVID, and we're $500 billion more in the hole because of it, at least in Australia. And many similar uh, scenarios are, are in, in any other country that you'd name to, care to name in the West that have gone along with these kinds of COVID policies. So we have a similar narrative with the anthropogenic climate change discussion. Again, it's not black and white. There need to be serious discussions had about optimal policy settings, and it should not be just that that one ideological side gets to carry the day. But unfortunately, that's what we've got. So in terms of where Sri Lanka should sit in these kinds of discussions, I think it should sit squarely on the side of Sri Lanka, <laughs> Sri Lankan interests. That is that is what you should be promoting. And forget about trying to play uh, bunny to whatever narrative is being floated by the globalist class or, uh, you know, whoever is the overseas leader. Just just focus on what is good for Sri Lanka. Be con congenial and, and cooperative, uh, if possible, of course. But at the end of the day, Sri Lanka leadership should be looking after Sri Lankan welfare. And so that's what should be at the primary top of the totem pole, the priorities that the, that the government has. And it needs to have advisors who can see all the angles of where that welfare comes from and how to support it in terms of economic and social policy. So that's what you should be focusing on, core business of the Sri Lankan public service, Stop with all of the, you know, the, the, the flaunting of ideological virtue signaling sort of stuff, nonsense that doesn't really lead to any improved state for Sri Lankan people and focus on real brass tax decisions 
that may or may not help Sri Lankans and do an evaluation of those policies, as I did of the, of the lockdown policies in Australia in the blue book that's behind me. That's the kind of thing that needs to happen so that there is accountability and transparency to the Sri Lankan public about the decisions that are made by its leadership. So I, I wouldn't say there's a particular right side to be on with, with the Ukraine and Russia scenario. Just I would be arguing if I were in Sri Lanka for what is good for Sri Lanka, as, as I would do here in Australia. Professor, uh, on those thoughts, if, if I can do as we are going into our conclusion sort of uh, point with this discussion, I want to ask you, what do we need to be aware of as Sri Lankans of the events or if, if like leaving aside these specific incidences like the Ukraine issue, we see uh, alternate currencies growing, we see uh, things like the cryptocurrency world developing. In, in a world like that, and in particular since you have pushed uh, the academic aspect of people being informed better would have really resulted in better decisions being made. What should Sri Lankans or in general the developing world really be careful of, really be mindful of in channeling the investments or the little money that they have so that they'll gain some form of recognition, some sort of product, some, uh, some productivity in the years to come? Well, I would say be wary of any narrative or storyline that promises some benefit that is not fully articulated that will be delivered based on some sacrifice you're asked to make. That's the pattern that we've been subjected to in the messaging from Western and, and general elite leadership over the last few years and even before then as well. So it's basically a religious narrative that says if you make this sacrifice now, then some great benefit will come your way. But the actual connection between the sacrifice and the great benefit is not articulated. That's your clue that it's actually probably not good for you and you should at least ask about that mechanism. Uh, if there isn't a good answer forthcoming, then don't put your money in that basket. Right? Put your money in the basket where you think there is a reasonable and a plausible, logical connection between your investment and good results for your family, for your own self, for your country uh, in the short run and the long run, but something practical and, uh, and, and provable rather than, for example, uh, you know, if you sacrifice to this and then you'll, you know, you will get this benefit that comes out of my model in some computer simulation, right? That's, that no longer should cut it. That kind of argument is not really a scientific argument. It's a religious argument. You should reject it. If you are talking about allocation of material, scarce material resources, where you just don't have that many more pe pennies to pinch, you need to be focused on the actual practical uh, returns from any investment that you make and not be seduced into these ideologies that ask you to just sacrifice as you would for a religion. Keep your religion and your and your politics and your economics separate, I would say. Uh, Professor, as a final question, if I could get your take on this now. Uh, increasingly, we see that the sort of ideology that you mentioned, sort of like the heterodox sort of thinking in this economic uh, space is also improving. In, in that sort of climate, Professor, where do you think, uh, I think you spoke a lot about the micro levels where people can really push their governments to get what they want, regardless of allowing the government to infiltrate into you know, random points because they actually failed in those regards, specifically around the world. And you referenced a lot of good states there as well. What exactly do you think on a micro level the people can do uh, to make these sort of subtle changes in their lives? Because in Sri Lanka, what we see is given that we have li li really moved into this sort of IMF thinking where liberalization, uh, I want to ask you about the institutions such as the central bank and what their role is also in this in, in the current climate. But when we are moving towards that, are there specific acts that can be done by the people on the ground that they can be mindful of? of either or, or not maybe starting their own businesses but being a little bit more entrepreneurial and like looking at self-sustaining themselves within their own specific circles within within a very micro level of society what would you say would be yeah. the particular advice given there yeah look i mean that that is exactly the direction i, I would advise we've seen how grassroots organizational structures have started to emerge after the COVID nonsense um, by, you know, driven by regular old people in their communities, forming uh, groups of mutual sustenance and mutual support because the existing institutions have failed us. So in Australia, we see, for example, um, the, the new medical societies because our existing medical system is just so complicit in the, in the COVID nonsense.
nonsense. So we have the uh, Australian Medical Practitioners Society, that's AMPS, and we have the Australian Medical Network, that's AMN. We also have Gaia, which is Global Alliance for Integrated Hearts and Healing. All of these organizations were started by regular doctors and nurses and people on the ground, right? They started their own networks in order to support it themselves and each other and to give good quality assistance to other people who were being failed by the established institutions. That is an option. You do not have to wait for the government to bless some institution in order for it to be useful. You can have your own informal network and the more you build trust in that network, the less you need those other formal institutions that have been complicit in the COVID nonsense. So that's one thing. Um, and you can also keep up to speed with what's actually happening around the world. You can go to reliable news sources. Do not get sucked into just mainstream media. Obviously, your channel is great. Um, I would advise your listeners look at Brownstone Institute's blog, so brownstone.org. They've been a, a wonderful purveyor of sensible stuff on, on COVID policy, but also on where the world is headed and what we should be doing um, to try to build a, a truly better world for our kids and recover from the, the darkness of the COVID era and to hold elites all over the world to account. Um, so building those kinds of networks of, of communication as well can be done locally. So you can start your own little newspaper or just, you know, a broadsheet, just a simple thing. That, that happens also in Australia. I've seen several new newspapers and media channels spring up. Um, messaging and media is just an incredibly important sector in order to empower people with confidence and, and a sense of really, you know, we don't have to just accept this ideology being pushed through the mainstream channels. We don't have to do that. We are our own people. And in fact, the power is with the people. When you talk about counting up all of the elites around the world, it's less than, you know, 1% of everybody. So 99% of the people are really able to make their own minds up and do what they like. And they're not part of that elite club that has so badly betrayed the populations of countries around the world during this period. So we should encourage those 99% to feel their muscles. You know, they have the strength and they need to reach out in their communities to find that strength. Again, celebrate diversity, team up with people who have different skills, different ways of doing things, different perspectives, respect that diversity and embrace it and, and enjoy your lives and show the rest of the world, we can have a good life even when we're not kowtowing to the latest craze of the of the globalist class. So that that is definitely the direction to move in. And obviously, it's more difficult the poorer you are, but it's also in some sense more necessary because it's the poor people who have fewer options and who are most okay. enslaved to these destructive narratives that are being pushed from elite circles. So they are the ones who can really gain the most um, by by linking forces with other people in the community. Right, uh, Professor, a very interesting discussion and I'm sure our viewers will get a lot of interesting things to take out from the explanation that you have given. Professor Gigi Foster joining us via Zoom from Sydney in Australia. He's a professor at the School of Economics at the University of New South Wales. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Professor, hoping to speak to you once again. Thank you very much for having me. All right, uh, I'd like to thank all of our viewers for staying with us on this special presentation. Join us again as we constantly keep you up to date with the latest on what's happening within our country and giving you all an authentic take about what is happening. This has been Adderi24. Thank you for staying with us. Have a good evening.